Rebecca Jernigan, your tour guide into discoveries, coming to you live from the heart of America to around the globe via the World Wide Web, satellite, and podcast. Let's journey together into the realms of the known to the unknown in search of enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful planet Earth. This is Rebecca Jernigan, host of Journeys with Rebecca, broadcast right here on Project Camelot TV. Welcome, every night, everyone. Tonight, I have a really cool guest for you. Uh, he's a return guest for me. Uh, might be a first time that you all have heard um, him here on this venue, Craig Campobasso. Now, Craig is a casting director. He's an author. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about his uh, professional career. He also worked on Dune for four years and numerous other projects. He's uh, directed, wrote, and produced the short film Stranger at the Pentagon, which was adapted from the popular UFO book authored by the do late Dr. Frank E. Stranges. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Stranger at the Pentagon, too, tonight with you uh, from Craig. Now, you know, Craig's passion is to write stories that provoke you, the reader, to think, to raise your consciousness, to expand your mind about creation while still entertaining in the Hollywood tradition. He does that very well, by the way. But tonight, we're basically here to explore his latest works in a trilogy series, which the first one was published on 11-11-11. What an apropos date. His first book was called The Autobiography of an Extraterrestrial. Saga 1 is I Am Tehran. The second one, The Autobiography of an Extraterrestrial Saga, Waking Tehran, and the third is Tyron's Dossier. It's the third and final installment of this trilogy, and that's what he's here. That was just released in August, and this Craig is now also going to be working on a fourth book entitled The Heroid Revolution. He's going to explain all of that to you tonight, but first as a reminder to everyone, if you have questions for Craig or myself tonight, uh, please place all of those questions in all caps so that Brian can easily uh, disseminate those and put them in the chat box for us here so that we can get that and answer your questions tonight. So without further ado, let me introduce the wonderful, the fabulous Craig Campobasso. Welcome to the show, Craig. Hey, how are you, Rebecca? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I am so excited to have you here. You always just make me giggle all the time. Uh, just, your energy just that, bubbly and just wonderful, and it's just fabulous to have you here, really, Craig. I'm so glad. I'm so happy to be back and talk to you. I've always enjoyed doing your show, and you're just such a incredible light spirit and, and akin to all of this information. So I love talking to you. Oh, thank you very much. And, you know, I guess as they say, it takes one to know one, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that goes right back at you. <laughs> and really, um, I have to tell people, I had you on. I've, 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 we've talked. I used to talk a lot more personally than we do now. Um, you know, as it is, you know, projects get in the way and time gets away from you. And before you know it, you go, oh, my gosh, it's been a couple of years. Um, we tried to get you on for your second book out called Waking Tirana. And that's the second in the uh, I Am uh, an Extraterrestrial Saga. Uh, but we yes. couldn't get our schedules to mesh up. And so then I again, know. time got away. And so then your third book came <laughs> out. I was so grateful that you contacted me to come on. Um, you know, the uh, many of the viewers and listeners out there are not maybe not familiar with this trilogy series. And... I know we want to get into all of that, but I didn't know if you wanted to talk a little bit first, Craig, before we got into your books about uh, maybe your your kind of your introduction into um, Stranger at the Pentagon, because I know there's a lot of cool stuff that's been happening with that. I, you know, I get, get a lot of your publicity stuff on that, um, and I go and I research it, etc. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that and your own personal experiences with that, and then we'll we'll get right down into it. What do you think? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'll give everybody a Stranger at the Pentagon update. And uh, while, while I'm talking, uh, if uh, the listeners want to go to strangeratthepentagon.com, 
uh, they can go there and uh, check everything out. Um, and we just revamped the website uh, as well. So it's all brand new. And uh, anyway, so I, I met Dr. Frank Stranges back in 2001. Um, we became fast friends, and uh, one thing led to another. And I sat with him for a couple of years listening to his stories. And, uh, and then along with the book, you know, put a feature film uh, screenplay together. <clears throat> and then... As I told him, we would have to raise the money for that feature film independently as I've been in the film business my entire life since I was 15 and many, many years as a casting director and in these later years uh, producing and directing as well. But uh, it's uh, because if we go to a studio, they would make Valiant Thor into, you know, Captain Universe. Yeah, and yeah, it just yeah. would not be the same story. And I've had many people approach me, and and really all they want to do is change the story. And and I promised Dr. Frank that the story would remain uh, truthful, uh, the way that it was intended to be. So, long story short, Dr. Frank passed away in November of 2008, and I just sort of shelved the project. And uh, I think back. Oh, maybe in 2012 sometime, I just kind of woke up, and I, I, ha I was uh, one of the casting directors on Sky Captain and the World of Tomorrow with uh, Angelina Jolie and Jude Law and Gwyneth Paltrow, and I also did another film called The Perfect Host uh, with a producer who did the Saw movies. So the Saw movies and Sky Captain were both financed independently because they made a short film which was like a very expensive sizzle reel, right? So back in the day of Star Wars when George Lucas went to the studio, they had no idea what he was talking about. So he had to go and create vision boards of the world of Star Wars, and that's what sold it. So. So that's why I decided to make a short film so everybody, you know, investors and everybody could see. Now, I never intended to show the short film to anyone. It was only uh, for investors, but it got out and everybody around the world started going crazy because this, this story has been around so long and people really, really want to see it. So... I'm very proud to say that I'm the first person to ever get a Space Brother, as they call them, film off the ground, right? Right. So, so the thing is, is so it got entered, uh, it, it, uh, the Burbank Film Festival made it an official selection right away, and we won for Best Sci-Fi Short Film. And, and the, they sold 275 seats for our 24-minute short film. And they had to put on a second screening. And then we won the following year out of over 400 and some entries, um, the Houston World Fest, uh, which is another huge film festival. So, um, and then just throughout all, you know, doing radio shows and... Um, uh, everything I did, uh, uh, George Nuri has a show on Gaia TV uh, called Beyond Belief, and uh, his producer, Tom Danheiser, has called me several times and, and told me, he said, you know, this week your show is like the number two watch show on all of Gaia, and now out of something like 1,700 shows that have aired on there, I think he said uh, our show was around number 20 of all watch shows ever. Wow. On that works. So there's a, there's a great um, – uh, people really, really want, want to know about this story. And I got a call earlier this year from Ancient Aliens. They had seen the short film. And uh, so I appeared on an episode – which aired in July called The Mysterious Nine, and they did a whole section on Stranger at the Pentagon, Valiant Thor, and um, they, even Paul Hellyer, uh, the former Canadian uh, Department of Defense, 
confirm the Valiant Thor story. So for the people out there that we have a lot of new viewers, right? We're going to have people sure. that will be viewing this. It is a short synopsis of who was Valiant Thor. Well, who is Valiant Thor? Yeah, he's, I'm sorry. I, not, that my bad. Not, yeah. No, I, yeah, as soon as it came out of my mouth before you said anything, I started to correct myself. I, oh, my God. I am so he's sorry. He's still around. Yes, he's still he around, is. so yes, they he say. Is. So uh, he, uh, he is what we would call an angelic in human form. He doesn't have a belly button. He doesn't age. And we, nobody really knows how old he is. Um, uh, in the angelics, when they are created beings, they could be created at birth and then given to celestial parents to raise, or they could be created as adults and move right into whatever their missions are. So there's different classifications and all of that. Now, I don't know which Valiant Thor is uh, in, in either of those, but he was given the commission to come here to Earth to help um, to help eliminate sickness, disease, prolong life, and to also discuss with, uh, uh, with our government um, the dangers of atomic weapons because they started, you know, blowing them up in the 40s. So he arrived in, uh, on March 16, 1957. Um, he met with Eisenhower, Nixon, the Joint Chiefs, and, uh, and now here's the thing, because if you can imagine what would it be like if you met a created being or an angelic in human form, you would immediately, your whole system, your whole emotional system would go into nirvana knowing that this is a brilliant being, right? You feel it and you sense it. Now, I have met other people who have met Valiant Thor, and they even go on to explain that there was even this, this beautiful scent to him that made them feel at peace. So, so imagine being the president and the vice president and understanding and knowing that this was somebody who was really coming to help the world. So Eisenhower put him on... Um, uh, three-year uh, VIP status uh, where they discussed the proposal. And uh, uh, in the end, uh, they rejected the proposal. Nixon and Eisenhower were for it. But uh, uh, the, rest of, uh, the rest of the powers that be turned it down due to that it would put doctors, nurses, pharmaceutical companies, all of these things out of business. Well, of course it would, because then everybody would be healthy. <laughs> so, um, Imagine that. Imagine <laughs> exactly. And so it, w it would put everybody in an economical ruin. Now, here's the other thing that I'd like to say. I'm not making this movie to... to um, uh, to say our government is bad. Those were decisions that were made, and I'm making this movie to help heal all of those things. And it's, there is no pointing of fingers. There is no nothing. It's a story that happened, but now we're in a time where we can change all that through healing and through understanding what choices had to be done back then. But now we're in a different age where we can make different choices. And, and the power is really back in the people's hands, right? I have to so agree. We, yeah. So, so um, I always want to make that clear because it, it's not an you know, anti-government film at all. It's just the story about what happened during that time, the choices that were made. But in, as we know that when anything that goes awry like that, the, it will always come around full circle, and it will heal, and it, and it, will, um, it will blossom into the beauty that originally was designed. So that's the good news. Now, uh, so Valiant Thor left on March 16, 1960, um, he returned in 1961, 
and has been here. Now, all this information I'm giving you is with the information that Dr. Frank gave to me. I have not physically met Valiant Thor or any of his crew, um, but I feel very connected to them, and I can explain a little bit of that in a minute. But um, the... Uh, uh, they they came back and these uh, his flagship is called Victor One and it holds up to 200 people. Um, I even have the blueprints. By the way, um, we I have a poster which has got Victor One on it and the actual blueprints to it. Um, I think it's under the section by book and DVD on the website. So uh, people want to get the uh, Stranger at the Pentagon book. All of these things are out of print, and these are brand new copies, and there's not many left. So everything that we make from that goes to help pay off the short film. And then we also have a donate button for the feature film if anybody wants to help, help us there to get storyboards and things together. Um, but the... Um, uh, the thing is, is that they have come back, and he has been here ever since. So his craft is stationed at Lake Mead, and then there are other Victor class uh, ships that are stationed in and around the Earth at over 287 locations. There is also a starship that's 14 miles long and seven miles wide that is up in our atmosphere that they go back and forth to. As a matter of fact, the craft, a lot of the Victor One craft, they travel on the beams that are directed from the actual starship. So they can travel in a quick trajectory, like go boom, and then boom, they're there. So um, it, it's quite an elaborate, exciting thing. Now, just imagine seeing these visuals and being on that starship and seeing all of these incredible spiritual technologies that are done through organic brains in these crafts, organic, um, uh, the skins of the craft. A lot of this, by the way, is, uh, uh, was brought to me in the Tehran books as well. But this is a universal thing, uh, the organic craft. So, um, so for instance, Tehran's craft, his DNA is mixed in with the skin of the ship, and when he when he uh, all he runs his own craft by his own thought, and it it registers his DNA structure. So if somebody else tried to fly his ship, they couldn't. Gotcha. Right. Makes so, sense. Yeah. Exactly, and especially if they if they go if they do um, jumps like across the universe because they can do these thought jumps. They go boom, boom, and they think where they want to be, and then boom, the craft is there. So, uh, but anyway, the uh, uh, Valiant Thor has been here uh, ever since, and um, is here still. Uh, I mean, I can only imagine what what his job would be is overseeing and helping and protecting the Earth, not only from ourselves, but from outside influences as well, because this 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 uh, world is in a state of flux, and it's it's shifting into the higher consciousness now. So, in this interim, you can only imagine the fight for it from both sides. So. Yeah, I, and I've said, and, you know, to be blunt about it, I, I've been saying for a few years, you know, this is war. I mean, we're we're at war in a sense, but the war isn't one that, like, you can go out with guns and go fight each other. That's not it. It's, no. it, it's it, that's not the fight. That's that's not it's, the war. The fight is consciousness. That's, that's right. what it is. And growth exactly and evolution. Yes. That's right. Absolutely. So... So it's it's uh, it's amazing. Uh, it's just an amazing story, and I, I'm just so happy to um, you know to be the one that gets to tell the story. And it's it's going to be visually beautiful, and we're gonna we're really going to get to see all of those worlds and and um, the starship and the Victor One class and all the really cool spiritual technologies that they have. Yeah. And, and, and you know, uh, that was one of the things that I, I wanted to comment on, on, not to interrupt you there, but your, your, your trilogy, 
the first book was it was really an eye opener with some of the some of the stuff. But boy, the second and third book, the spiritual technology. Um, you know, there's a lot of people here on this planet today that are. Uh, awakening their higher consciousness is coming into effect if you will or it's you know been enhanced whatever you want to however you want to say that and right. thoughts create yeah and and you know I've been saying that for years and then you know I read your books and it brings it back again and again and I mean it hits it home even harder you know be careful what you think because your thoughts is what creates it's part of the collective right yeah. So if you can That's train right. yourself not to think the negative or the crappy stuff or all the hateful stuff and hurtful stuff and harmful stuff, you're not adding more junk to the junk. That's what we're trying to get rid of. We're, we're, we're trying to overcome that. That's we're right. trying to absorb it. We're trying to, you know, neutralize it, so to speak. So thoughts right. really do create. And, you know, even if if, if somebody isn't, isn't a, a a a meditator or you know into a lot of spiritual aspects or the metaphysical aspects in life they can change their thoughts um, yes. if nothing else it's healthier for the individual it it is and i i have uh i would love to just share a couple of tools love it uh, for people that don't meditate and people who t tend to take on the negativity and that it lives in their mind um, you just have to keep retraining your thoughts. So if you just sit down in a quiet space and just close your eyes, take three to five deep breaths, and then just clear your mind, and then imagine putting a giant oval magnet over your head and turn that magnet on and ask that magnet to pull up all negative thoughts that are in your vicinity that are being directed to you, by you, um, and, and just have it, pull it up into the magnet and then tell the magnet to transform it into positive thoughts. And you'll be surprised as you do that. And it's just a quick little five minute thing. That's yeah, all you have to simple. do when you're done. Yeah. And simple when you're works. done, just say, yeah, and just bathe yourself in, in the rainbow, right? And in a rainbow colors. And then it's quick, it's easy, because so many, I, I am a meditator, but so many people I know say, I don't know how to meditate. I, I can't meditate. And I'm like, yeah, you can't hear. Here's a quick little thing, right? I mean, uh, another thing that I tell people to do is Stephen Halpern has a chakra, a seven-minute chakra um, musical thing that tones your chakras, which are your energy, seven energy centers in the physical body, and it's free. You just just Google Stephen Halpern, go to his website, and you can download it for free, put it on a disc and play it, and just do what I said, and then boom, you're done. And it's quick and it's easy, and um, as you advance more and more, you, you know, you'll start learning more about meditating and, and clearing your thoughts as well. And if the thoughts really keep invading, in, invading you, then what I always do is replace it with three good thoughts immediately and then just train my mind to go away from whatever that is and I never watch the news because I'm sensitive so if I watch the news then I take on all of that so it's just a, a just another choice it's a choice that I've made so let me I want to address that because I yeah <laughs> there's so many things that that come through the TV set, people just have no idea. I, there's there's so many yeah. things that I can't watch. It's not even just the news, Craig. For me, sometimes it's it's the commercials. Sometimes it's the content of a show. Um, it's it's like um, the energy of of the actors and the you know everybody behind the scenes. All that stuff people don't realize that. It, it, that energy is held in that celluloid, even if we call it a digital world, and that's right. projected outwards into your filling your house with that stuff. You can't yeah. see it, you can't touch it, you can't smell it, but it's there, and yeah. it's especially bad for empaths that don't haven't figured out how to not take on something that doesn't belong to them. There are more empaths than you can imagine. I'm sure you know. Yes. And, yes. And you absolutely. Just, I mean, you have to just start realizing. You step into a room and you start feeling weird. 
it's probably because you're picking up on something else. You got to follow that intuition, but don't absorb it. It's not yours. Don't let it become yours, right? That's so, right. That's exactly. Right. So, listen to Craig and don't watch the news. <laughs> <laughs> really, don't, because it it just you just take on all that stuff. You just take it on and take it on and you, take it on. And it, then it starts eating away at you. And before you know it, it, you you just don't even know why you're just so angry and grumpy all the time. Yes. So, um, so and it's, sad. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. sad and all of that. And, you know, in a sense, it's a weird kind of programming, but you have to deprogram it. It's like, you know, I once listened to Marie Osmond talk and, and what she said was, amazing. She said, you know, when I had all my children, I realized that they were little computers and whatever I put into them was what they were going to be. And she said, and that's what really made me raise them really right. And, and I just loved, you know, how she, how she said that. And, you know, we all know that she's uh, Mormon and Mormons um, are, uh, are not for uh, LGBT community, and she has a gay daughter who that she talks about all the time, and how much she loves her gay daughter, and how she, you know. So what I love is that she's just talking about love, right? And that's what she injected into all of her children, and it's the same thing for us as we are spiritually growing. We're wa- whatever we watch, that programming's going into us, even though it's unconscious. That's right. So we have to do that, and we have to learn, you know, when it starts becoming too much. That's why it's really great to just do a five, seven-minute little meditation in the morning to clear it all out. I try and sage my entire house at least once a week just to clear everything out. And uh, because it really is pro- they say that it's proven that it does transform the... Uh, the negative ions into positive ions. Yeah, I, that's I was going to say. Scientifically, they have proved that saging your yes. house is actually a scientific thing. That it's actually beneficial yes. to you to do that. I mean, yes. yes. So I'm like, yeah. Yes. Finally, we're getting Absolutely. some breakthroughs. Minor as they may yes. be, we'll take them. <laughs> we'll take them. Absolutely. So, uh, but anyway, those are great little simple things. And Teal, who is a vice commander on Victor One. She said the most amazing thing uh, to Dr. Frank once uh, that he shared with me um, was that somebody was wondering, you know, they they were having their business in too many other people's affairs, meaning they were trying to tell them that they should be doing it this way and they should be doing it that way. And, And her advice was, you should only concern yourself with your own spiritual growth and not worry about everyone else. That's what you're here to do. And I went, you know, what a simple truth that is. Very simple. And and we, yeah. we could all learn to abide by that simple truth. Yeah, Seriously. Absolutely. So when we the get hardest deep- thing to do is somebody we love mm-hmm. is to allow them to be and to make their own mistakes. Right? Agreed. Hard to do, man. Hard to do. Hard to do. Hard to do, especially when they're family and they're somebody you love. So, there. I so how I approach it the, these t- this time. Uh, you know, I've been approaching it for many many years this way. Instead of sort of stepping in and saying something, I just say, if you need me for something, if I feel that I know somebody is going through something, I will say, if you need me, I'm here. Come and talk to me. And if you want my advice, I'll be happy to share it with you. There you go. And, and then that way it's done in an exchange and not a, you should do this, right? So, right. Well, and then whenever uh, you yeah. order somebody to do something anyway or you tell them you have to do it this way, they, if you notice, people will become defensive because it feels as if they don't have a choice. That's right. Absolutely. And every, we all have choices. And speaking of choices, Please. let's 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 move into your books because your books are choices. Yes. I mean, let me tell you, and I tell everyone their choice should be not that they, they have to, but it would be really great if they read your books because they really are very. I tell you what it is. I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize my experience reading your books. Okay. Oh, fantastic! Thank your, you. Your the first book was 
first of all, they're very descriptive, and and you do have illustrations in there. Uh, they're characters or people, um, right. beings that are that you have described in your books. Um, they're, they're, the storyline is really all about these different beings. You talk about the different hierarchies, et cetera, and so so forth. But it's it's very descriptive. Uh, the background, where it comes from, where you went, who you saw, what the ships were like, what the landscape was like. Um, and, you know, I, I think I, we've had this off-air conversation where I told you about where I was taken to these places and these colors. They, You can say, well, it looks like purple. It kind of looks like blue and it kind of looks like green. But it goes beyond the purple, the blue, and the green. Yes. Uh, I mean, it it's indescribable colors. It's as close as you can get, you know, in 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 my terms, as to explain what it is that it, that I was witnessing, that I was experiencing, that I was viewing, et cetera, and so forth. Right. So your books, yes. they go into way depth about the somebody's eyes, example. Right. I mean, just it, right. it's fantastic. So as we're going yeah. through the book, first of all, you set number one up really well because you left us with a cliffhanger, which was your thing that you needed to do at the very end there. <laughs> right. Yes. Which we can't give away. I'm not it's giving great, it away. You know, so I didn't say. It's a great ending. Yes, yeah. Everybody was. loves that ending, by the way. And was, I remember, yeah, it's everybody. That's the one thing everybody comments about. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was, And it was great. It was perfect. But right. then book two, book two was... Uh, it was almost over. It's almost overload, not in a negative way. Right, but I mean, right. The descriptions and the people, and then the storyline just explodes from the first book to the second book. The storyline explodes. We're following your progress from right. human being to one who has uh, past life memories that has been directed to different people here on this planet that have helped and assisted you, unlocked you in some way. Um, and began the whole unlocking of you and your life previously, what your mission is, who all of the players are in the cosmos and celestials, if you will. Um, and when I say all of them, I'm talking about the ones that most people are familiar with. You talk about different galaxies and solar systems and planets and things. Um, it's fantastic. So you're awakening, you're stepping into your consciousness, you start having experiences, and I'm going to have you talk about that specifically here in just a little bit. And sure. you go on and you begin to unfold this story about what's really going on. And as you read this story, it becomes like a mystery novel. I know it wasn't supposed to be, but it is. You I keep, know, you I keep know. And it the pages spurs going, you on, it oh, spurs oh, you on. What? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and then you just kind of kind of keep flipping the pages, right? And you get just, it's just, it's mind-blowing how it reads like a mystery novel, but it's not a mystery novel. Right. But it's like, it's not a whodunit, but that's what it almost feels like when you're reading it. Then you, you, you get done with book two, and you're going, okay, where... How does this end? Where does this go from here? I figured, right. oh well, gosh, it just can't go much else from here, right? And in this, yeah. in the second book, you develop the storylines from family members and their interactions with each other, uh, interactions with spouses and families, and the hierarchy of the angels and the different realms, the celestial beings. Uh, you get into a lot of the metaphysical aspects, what we call metaphysics. Um, all the higher known, un unknown to us currently technology that's available to us. Um, yes. Then in the third book, you take these characters that are, and I call them characters, some of them are for real for you, most of them are for real for you, and we're going to have you explain that too. Um, sure. You, you get in the third book, and the third book, these characters begin to cement um, relationships more. They begin to learn, and as you're as you're looking through all this, as you're as you're reading through all this, rather, you kind of go, you know what? This kind of sounds like real life here. Right, right. You know, I mean, it sounds like yeah. it's it's an elevated real life, but that's that's was the, it just like that's what clicked in for me. I was like, this is like real life stuff. This yeah. is real life stuff in an in an elevated form. Yeah. In, in an elevated platform and plat, you know, whatever you want to call it, it. It was fantastic. Um, I mean, it's got, you know, 
good doers and evil doers in it and it's got you know uh, romance and surprise romances and you know um, what it really means just to love somebody and your story about Marie Osmond and her and her daughter was yeah, fantastic yeah. I mean because I, when you what is love love is love it knows no right. boundaries there's no boundaries right. on it there's there's not a a male and female two females three people five people whatever it is love is love is love is love is love right absolutely it's just love absolutely. And, and I think people forget that even though I'm in a male form, I'm half female and I'm half male. I came from my mother and I came from yes. my father. That's I'm right. half and half. That's right. Right? So sexuality has nothing. There is so many sexual. I mean, all, we all know on this planet we do have people who are hermaphrodites who have both. We have androgynous beings, but then, you know, book three will explore other types of sexuality that are even beyond, was even beyond my thinking, right? And, and I touch upon it a little bit there, but it really and truly is, it's all about soul love. It has nothing to do with anything else. So, and, and what's really interesting is anybody who is going through um, uh, issues on this world um, about LGBT people or, or people who are different or unique is that... W it, your next lifetime, you're going to be the exact opposite. You're going to experience every aspect of being human because that's what you chose by coming here, right? So it's amazing. I had this conversation with Sylvia Brown, who wrote the foreword to my book, uh, the first book. Right. And Sylvia said the same thing uh, to me. She said, if, uh, you know, if somebody's having a problem with a certain thing and they're just belligerent and, and bigoted or whatever, she said, they will come back again and they'll be the other person. And I said, yes, I know. I said, I absolutely know that. So because remember, when, when you leave this world, you go back into unconditional love and you, review, you have a life review. Your review goes by in seconds of your entire life. But there's a caveat at the end of that. You're not only going to feel what you felt with every person you interacted with, but you're now going to take on their feeling body and feel what you, how you impacted their life in a negative or a positive way. And that's where the soul comes in and starts feeling, oh my God, you know, what regret I have. And, and you want to come and you want to correct those things. How many times have psychics said, right, a psychic medium said to somebody, you know, so-and-so's here and they really want to say that they're sorry for doing that to you, right? Because they, they really want this to be lifted off their soul and really live in unconditional love. And that's really what we're all doing here. We're all on this planet learning love yep. in all aspects, every shape and form. There is no other reason for us being here. We're not just here to uh, go on vacation. We're on a vacation on, in this world to learn love. And when we graduate from this world, we're going to go to another world and we're going to learn something new there. And we're going to keep going from world to world to world to world. And these are all learning spheres and each one teaches a different, a different aspect of the entire creation. And there are things out there that we can't even comprehend yet because we, we're not even fully conscious. And that's where we're all heading. And that's the purpose of... Um, the Autobiography of an Extraterrestrial, the saga, the three books, is for people to understand what duality is. The lead character of Tehran really is the reader. And so you go on this journey with Tehran and understand his duality, how he overcomes his duality, interacts with the universal duality, and then interacts with other friends of his who are dualistic, who are also trying to become fully conscious, 
and understanding everything in that aspect. And then we have the heroid race, which is a whole different interesting factor is that there was a world that that destroyed itself uh, from racism, hate, and greed, and there was nowhere for those souls to go. So they created... Um, a heroid race. So these are these are humans inside of synthetic created bodies, and they and it was the soul's choice whether they wanted to continue learning in the spirit realm or if they wanted to continue learning in a body. But then they would they would come and they would be of service to the rest of humanity because they wanted to learn how to ascend. So, Isn't that interesting? I wow. know. I was. I was. When I when I read about them, I was like, "Oh my goodness gracious!" Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was that was an interesting turn of yeah. information. Um, by the way, I'll, uh, for anybody who's listening, if they want to go to the website while we're on, it's autobiography of on anet dot com, and that website's all revamped and. Um, we also have a super fan special now too, so people can get all three books either in soft cover or hard cover, or order them. And I sign all the books uh, to everybody and personalize them as well. So, um, and the super fan special, you get some additional little goodies as well, which is there on the website. And by the way, on the website we have a lot of the color pictures um, from uh, book three. And they're so spectacular. Uh, they're on the home page, and they sort of thread through. So uh, so have fun exploring, you guys. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, uh, it's, it, it's, it's actually a, a fantastic, it's a fantastic site. It's a fantastic uh, trilogy. So we're going to drill down a little bit on it. We're going to yeah. get a little bit more more explicit with, with, um, with it, because it, that was kind of like a, an over view so to speak yeah. of the whole series what what we just kind of synopsized there you know right not that that yeah. was a real word but i make up words i have to tell you <laughs> i have my own dictionary i swear i my kids used to laugh at me when i was raising my kids because i come up with these words and where did you get that i don't know it's just so you know i've always had my own language and <laughs> some people just <laughs> It's true. It's true. I do it too. Yeah, I love it. I think it has something to do with, you know, with being just who we are. Um, right. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about the first book again, uh, uh, just kind of to review it, is an introduction to Tehran and right. uh, the awakening of your consciousness. Now, you called it an autobiography. And, it, you know, we had we had a couple of conversations about this. I think you were on the air a couple of times about it. We also talked about Strangers at the Pentagon coming up. That was before you even did that, made the short right. film. You were talking about different things that you wanted to do with that. So it's yeah. really good to know that you've you went through all that and you've, you're getting that online and it's, it's just fabulous. So let's, let's, let's put that into some kind of a little quick review on your own personal experiences and is this is this story that you have put into a book in three books is it your story well the here the thing is is when i had in um the mid 80s i had a major spiritual awakening uh i woke up um like you wouldn't believe and it was done through master teachers that began visiting me in my dream states and i would look at them and just i would wake up in the morning and just go wow i my whole body just felt like i was in this blanket of love that's all I, how i can explain it. it it felt celestial it just felt good and then I didn't really think of it that much, but this became, it was reoccurring for several months. And then all of a sudden I started waking up inside the dream and realizing that this was actually happening, that my spirit was traveling to this other realm to be with these three beings. And as that progressed and progressed, then 
I started to feel and understand a little bit more about who they were. I began to, to receive their names. And then I, and then after a few months of that, I would again wake up in the dream. I would be in nirvana. I would open my eyes and I would see their astral forms standing at the foot of my, bre- at the foot of my bed smiling back at me and I was like oh this is real this is real and and now mind you I never had any fear about it whatsoever because everything was in complete unconditional love so so um so it began like that and then what ended up happening was one night um I went to their realm and they fed me from their hands a golden light that came in, in into my soul and it made it feel like it ballooned out and all of this gold light see that I could feel the soul history of beings now mind you I'm casting during the day and this is happening anywhere from 8 to 12 times a day because of an actor walked in and I felt the beauty and everything of their soul history I would have to excuse myself, go into the other room. And I'm not talking about crying. I'm talking about sobbing. It was, a, it was an, an intense purification of, of, um, of my soul coming to light is how I can explain it. Like coming to light and understanding the enormity and the whole of everything that's interconnected. So that's what I felt, is I felt the interconnectedness into everything. And then they woke, woke, uh, woke, uh, they ignited my light body one, one night, and from that time forward, I started astral traveling to other worlds, and I would then start conversing with these other master teachers and start learning from them and things like that. Now, I had many different experiences like this, and I, I'm not going to go into all of them here. Um, but the thing is, is that I, I went, I had, the, the, the crying la- lasted for about eight months. I thought it was never going to end, and I was very happy when it did, but I felt incredible at the end of it because, you know, if you, when you're sobbing every single day, you just don't, especially for eight months, you, you really wonder you know when when is this going to stop <laughs> right right so um but i uh, i came out of that and um i really just started i started writing about all of these experiences that i was going through and journaling them and and i ended up writing a 400 page book about it and one of the one of the master teachers at the end of the book um, came to me, and I, I had gone to Mount Shasta. I was there. I went there to go to treat myself. And um, and by the way, this master um, that I was talking about, whose name is Father Jacobaba, he is from the world of the Great I Am. So I travel to Mount Shasta which is the home on earth of where the I am teachings originated from, from the Ballards that came out of, uh, from there. And they have the I am reading room there. And I have a major experience with the great I am while I'm there. And I come home and the master teacher says to me, what would you say if I told you, you just wrote that book for yourself? And I said that I learned a lot about myself. And he said, now it's time to sit down and write the real one. Do not censor anything that comes through you. And they said, keep writing and writing and writing until nothing else comes out. And we'll tell you when you're done for the day. Uh So they would wake me up at 3 in the morning. I would start writing at 3 in the morning because they said that's when the brave waves were down and it was easier to come through, and um, at that time in the apartment I was living in, there were three portals where I could see their energy forms come down, and when I started writing and the energy forms would come down, my body would ring with chills for like 10 minutes. 
it was so strong. And then I would just write and write. And I had, you know, again, I had no idea what I was writing or where things were going. I wanted to stop and censor it, but I kept going. And then I started to understand the story. So really, book one and book two, in the beginning, were 900 pages. Wow. Yes. So then I had to go in later on and cut book one down and then decide what I, you know, what I was going to leave in and take and what was just needed for book two. So that's why book two is a much larger book. I think it's about 500 pages. So um, anyway, so that, so that was my introduction into the writing of it. So it was like clearing this vessel to be a, a clear vessel to receive this information. And mind-blowing information it is. When you get in there and you read it, I mean, you know, uh, the things that affected me in book one the most um, that I particularly uh, love are um, the, uh, the shadow, which um, the shadow chamber, where Tarang goes into the shadow chamber and actually meets his own shadow and has a conversation with his own shadow. Um, that's mind blowing. Uh, that was just mind blowing, and um, and I and I also love the water goddess because it's the, it's the opposite of the masculine. It's the intuitive flow. So so we got you know both those things where he's pulling his duality together so that his heart and mind merge, and then he's making decisions from the heart and no longer from the ego from the mind. So, so, so there, you know, that sort of sums it up. But then we get to meet his, his wife and, um, you know, children, and we learn about his early life and those kind of things. I've often thought it would be really fun to at least write one prequel book to sort of learn what happened even before that. So, um, so I may do that in the future. Well, I think that would be really an interesting thing because it talks about your own personal uh, metaphysical journey, spiritual journey. Uh, right. And it gets into, you know, where people can relate even more to your experiences because they themselves may have had same or similar type of experiences and they can put uh, names to it. You know, my, my deal was, Craig, for me personally, was that... Um, as I was going through life, there was I couldn't there wasn't anybody I could talk to about what it was that I was experiencing, or right. sensing, or seeing. Right. There, I mean, you know, I grew up in a very very rural town, um, very very small community. There were no people around, and I didn't really get away from that and, and get out to explore the world until I was in my twenties, um, and and not as much as I really wanted to. And eventually, I was probably in my 30s before I started meeting people of what I would call like minds, and I would explain to them, you know, what it was that I was seeing or feeling or sensing. And then once that happened, I found other people that had done the same things or experienced the same things or gave me insight as to, well, that means you're this or that means this, you know, giving me more of the metaphysical terms as opposed to just describing what it feels like to be an empath or an right. intuitive or a clairvoyant or a medium or whatever the case may be, right? right. Um, and so it was, it was, it's really, really nice to if you could do something like that because I think people could really relate to that. Your book speaks on that. I mean, even the first book speaks on that. And, of course, in the second and third books really gets way deep into it. Um, and for those who are... Mm, how should I say this? Um, those who, who have been looking forward to raising their own consciousness level, what, what could be their life cycles? What, what is it that they could learn about themselves by learning how to either astral travel or, I'm, you know, I call myself an experiencer. Um, right. Yes. That, I mean, I, I, I ha call, I, for uh, some people I call them dreams because they don't understand when I say, you know, I had an experience. Well, where were you? Well, I'm bed. <laughs> you know, they're like, okay, well, that doesn't count. You were sleeping. Okay, so I was in a dream. Right. We'll call it a dream, right? 
Yeah. For other people. But you are experiencing Right, right. This. but that they don't have the concept that right. the soul travels and you are going to other places that your physical body can't take you. So you are still having an experience. You just don't have experiences in your physical body. That's right. And so, you know, yeah. this, this, I think, is a, a huge step in, in this whole journey for people, your books, um, because as I was reading, I have to tell you, when I was reading, I was like, you know, that person seems very familiar to me, their character, their personality, uh, the things they've done. I think, hmm, I might have, must have run into them at something at some point. You talk about soul connections yeah. and soul families. And so, yeah. you know, this is, you know, I called it like a, you know, a mystery it was more of a, it's a mystery because you don't know what's coming on the next page, but it's also extremely enlightening. It also gives hope and it gives yes. understanding of yes, what's absolutely. going on that we're, yes. we're all knowledgeable of. We just have to unlock the door and let it in. That's right. That's right. And, and the end result is this planet is going into its perfection stage. So right now it's just going through you know, through the stages that it needs to, to get through. But in my soul, I know this planet will be in its perfection stage soon. I don't know the time frame, but I know that it's going there. It, there is no way that it's not. So that's the hope that everybody should hold on to. And everybody can help it move it along by working on themselves spiritually. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to throw you off maybe here just a little bit. I mean, it's not uh, specifically about the books, but it's about the statement that you just made about the basically what you're talking about is earth the whole planet earth which would also include the entire solar system, I would assume, cuz she's part of it. Uh, yeah. I mean, everything is symbiotic, right? Yes, uh, right. It's it's in a period of raising its own level from some say from 3D we skip 4D because some people say it's an astral plane, and then we go right. into 5D. I, you know, again, it, I think it's a matter of perception. But what we're really in to get cut through all that, we're just talking about taking up the next ascension ladder of, right. of human experience. Other people are saying that there that that there's the third dimensional earth will remain those who are raising the level of earth and the consciousness of the earth and we'll go along on that we'll go along on that we won't even know that there is a division so to speak or a separation from third dimension to whatever fourth or fifth depending on your belief systems i'm not going to put right. anything out there what's your right. take on that how do you feel about that well, I think that uh, I have two thoughts on that. And one is, yes, everyone who is working on themselves said it automatically. Every, every layer of the universe is consciousness. So there could be dark consciousness over there. That's where those things go and stay because that's what they do. Or there's different levels. Of there, so everyone, when this planet goes and decides it's going to, there's enough group in the entire world, then that soul lifts into the next fourth or fifth dimension. And then the other thought of that is, if we're all in unconditional love, does everybody go? Yeah. Right. So, and now I don't have the answer to that, but those are the those are the two. I mean, those are really the only two scenarios that I can see because I, you know, I, I, if I'm thinking in earth terms or human terms, the first one feels right. But if I'm thinking in a higher consciousness term, everybody's really unconditional love and everyone's just playing parts down here. Right. Right. To right. learn all of that. So what if all, all of, all of the souls that are on the plane, um, how long have they been here? We all know we're in soul groups. I meet, I, I'm not kidding you. I mean, I meet so many people. I'm just like, oh, my God, you're my soul group. Right, right? exactly. And, and you, just, you just pull them in and you know who is. And, and, um, and are we all in these groups? And in these groups, we're all helping each other to raise up. 
and each group. So even if somebody is lagging behind, or the other is helping to pull them up as well. So I really think in the end it really is all about unconditional love. And if we really are all just playing, you know, I'm a mean guy this lifetime, I'm a nice guy the next lifetime, I'm a spiritual being this lifetime, I believe in this religion this lifetime, I believe in this religion the next lifetime, my next lifetime, I just believe in spirituality. You know, all of these different belief systems become all ingrained into you like like an incredible evolvement, and you learn to just love every aspect of it. So um, it's just interesting. It's, it's also fascinating to me what consciousness is because everything is consciousness. Well, absolutely. You know, uh, here's, here's something that, that I learned many years ago, and it always struck me as that was kind of, you know how you have just a, something little that comes along in it, and it, it, it just one little statement somebody makes or something yeah. that you read, and then all of a sudden your whole world just kind of pops open and you start thinking about all the relationship to whatever else that means, right? So somebody right. told me, you know, my thing is, is you know, nobody wants flies in their house, right? I mean, really, they're, right. they're, they're quite not clean creatures, right? right? So what do we normally do? We chase them around with a fly swatter, we swat them or try to shoo them out of the house, whatever the case may be, right? So yeah. one day I'm, I'm in, in there and I'm uh, trying to swat a, a fly. And see, it sounds terrible to say that, but that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to kill the fly. You don't want it flying around. Right. And somebody said to me, you know, science has proved that if you show your intent, that it, it that um, psychically that that um, fly knows that you're going to try to kill it and it's going to, it can feel your vibrations. And that's why you can't kill flies. Hmm. Flies, flies have an intuition to know that somebody's chasing them and wants to kill them because you're exuding that thought you want to kill that fly and that fly recognizes that energy signature seriously and that's right. why well, they, and I thought I okay think it, I think it's a survival mode yeah yeah, they run. it's a survival mode. You chase it, it runs. <laughs> well, even when you're standing there and they're real, they're they're sitting there and you're sitting there and you're you're both not doing anything, but you're thinking I'm going to splat this fly, and just about the time you get ready to swing, it flies off before you're it even chasing. Yeah, yeah. So they do have an antenna. They have an antenna that is, and and by the way, this was also a scientific thing that they did that they realized that that flies understand that they're in danger. Because you send out that energy. That's see, it's about a thoughts. Right. Yeah. Okay. So it's reading some kind of an energy signature. It may be low on the totem pole as far as sentient beings are concerned, but it certainly yes. has some yeah. antenna, right? Yeah. So, so now I try really hard just to, to talk to them and send them out the door instead of swatting them. I can't hardly do it, but I still don't want them in my house. <laughs> Well, because they do land on things that <laughs> they should not be landing on us after they've landed on. So, That's correct. Um, That's correct. And they do carry disease, and they do carry a lot of stuff. So I've asked some spiritual teachers over the years what they thought about things like that and little bugs and critters, and they said if you put the thought form out in your home that um, if you come into my home and you want a master to send you on into your next life, then when, if you're in my home, then you're allowing me to do that. Or you can, if it's something that you can scoop up and put outside, which sometimes you can do with spiders and things like that, that that's fine as well. And then I knew another... And at the first animal psychic medium that I met, and she worked with my dog at the time, Pebbles. I which remember was, Pebbles. She was, like, amazing. She had her down to a T. Um, we were sitting talking, and there were gnats and flies and stuff, and she would just go, so what? And she'd swat them with her hand, and she'd kill them in her hand. <laughs> and she'd go, on to your next life. And I said you're an animal communicator and you do that? And she goes, yeah. 
I just sent them on in the, to their next life. <laughs> like, well, wow. I, I, I kind of like the idea. Look, if you, you step into my realm, understand that I will send you on your way. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, so uh, anyway. <laughs> I like that one. I'm going to keep that one. I normally just say, look, I don't, nothing, no insects. You're all outside. And it right. does help. It does help. But every once in a while, you get some flies that come in. And you, you do, do, yeah. But and I will tell they, you. They are unclean. They are. They're extremely unclean. Yeah. And yes. so now they have a new contraption, by the way. Now they have this thing for spiders that you can literally, it looks like a little, it looks almost like little plastic fiber optic thingies. And it's a little wand and you push down on it and you put it over the spider and you push on it and it grabs the spider without killing it. And then you <sighs> take it outside and pull the thing and it releases it. I was like, well, oh, that's, that, that's awesome. I thought that's that was the coolest awesome. thing ever. I was like, wow, it's a humanitarian thing. That's right? so, so cool. I As know. seen I on know. TV. <laughs> I would actually buy that. Honestly. I would too. I would buy that. I think that that's a great contraption. And, um, you know, as long as it's not a black widow that can sting and kill and, you know, because you really just don't want those around children. No. Uh, because if they don't know what it is and, uh, you know, they get stung, God forbid. Yeah, for sure. So, so you know, let's get but, back uh, to the book for a minute here. So we've, sure. got, we've got this fabulous storyline about uh, your, your awakening, your learning how to astral travel, you're learning how to telepathically communicate, you have manifestations, uh, quite a lot of activity going on in the first book. And the second book just continues on. You know, I asked you before the show started, how how did you get the rest of the material? And you kind of, you know, uh, put that into a form for me, into some a few statements about how that, you know, they would manifest at the foot of your bed and that you were telepathically communicating and that sometimes they would take you there, which is experiencing it, whatever the case you want to yeah. ask or travel. Um, your, your dog, obviously, Mr. Miss Pebbles there, uh, right. was with you as well, which I found really fascinating. Um, yeah. I've, I've had yeah. a couple of creatures, a, a couple of wonderful, wonderful uh, four-legged friends of mine that have passed over, and um, they're just, they were just, and I've had a lot, but there's been a, just a couple. You know how that is when you get that heart connection with a certain animal. Um, yeah. It's just there. It's just, you know, you just absolutely love them. Um, and they love right. you. And so I felt Pebbles in the book. And I thought that was really cool how she was incorporated or he was incorporated. I don't know, I think it was a she. she yeah. I thought it was a she. she. And, um, yeah. and what her job was, I thought that was quite interesting in the second book. What her yeah. job was. I mean, she was she was quite extraordinarily helpful, and yes. And I want to say to to people who are out there even thinking about maybe getting Craig's book, these the storyline talks about good and evil. Basically, it also talks about obviously awakening the consciousness, uh, learning what unconditional love is, um, what it means to do a soul review when you right. are ready to pass over. Um, which, by the way, there's been a couple of people I have, I know that have actually been through this review themselves. They didn't understand yes. exactly what it was. Uh, I've been through it already. I've been through it several times in this yes. lifetime. Yeah. yeah, and I think we do that to kind of purge ourselves. I think it's about, yes. we, and then we get to another level, and then we have to purge again, because yes. kind of, you reach this plateau. And it's just a process of evolution, so I think maybe we could speak to that a little bit for, especially for the viewers out there, to let people know. Um, I was telling you that you know a year ago, or so I had a, a health bout and it put me down for a long time, and a lot of soul searching went on. There was a lot of, a lot of things that went on, um, and the purging of information and and the realization of what. Uh, bonds and binds that we put on ourselves and we don't even realize that we've done that. Um, there's a lot of things that we all carry with us. Um, it's kind of in a DNA kind of a thing, a cellular memory sort of thing, yeah. protection and things like that. And and here's the deal. We don't need to do that anymore. We just haven't. There's been there's so many of us out here don't realize that we just 
can let go of it. <laughs> we don't have to right. carry it. We don't have to do it. <laughs> right. Well, it's it's what we uh, talked about before we went on air. Is uh, most uh, star seeds will go through a death and resurrection process in their life uh, because star seeds and uh, messengers and mighty messengers that come in in incarnation missions, what they're doing is they're quickening their own, they're taking their duality and, 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 and zooming full state, it was full speed ahead towards the becoming fully conscious. So when they're doing that, they're not afraid to dive into and feel the pain and feel all of the things that most people push away and and then that that pain gets locked in their body and that's how disease and stuff starts but what ends up what ends up happening for most star seeds and I went through it myself I had you know a a death and a resurrection where I went through where I sh- I really shouldn't be here on the planet I should actually have passed away but I'm still here almost 6 years later so and we're so grateful you are and I am too, because you know, otherwise the world wouldn't have the books. So um, that's right. You know, so or you, or, and I love being here doing this. So it's it's fun for me, and and it, it's um, and I love when you know people get it. Um, so so the thing is, is that it it going through that death and resurrection, and what we're going through, and I've talked to many other star seeds recently. And some of them are just starting going through those kind of bouts as well. Is that if you understand what you're going through, that you're going through it, and that if you stay strong and you stay positive, and you understand that when you come out the other end of it, that you will be that much closer to becoming fully conscious because you've just zoomed through years and years and years of. Um, uh, evolvement in a short period of time. So it's an it's an incredible process. And by the way, uh, I didn't know that you could have a second spiritual awakening. I had one a couple of years ago that lasted for a full year. And um, so uh, I now realize that we can have many of them in our lifetime. So each time I process through it, um, I just getting. I keep understanding really what unconditional love is, even on a more deeper, minute level. Um, and this last round, uh, it's it really, really, really changed me, even more towards um, compassion, and um, and learning other things on a deeper level, like understanding if somebody is just doing something horrifically wrong to you that you it's to still love them in that way but not to degrade them or put them down or whatever but to allow them to just continue on whatever path that they're doing and just viewing them from a distance and allowing them to work through what they're working through, um, but you still supporting them spiritually. It doesn't mean you have to support them physically, but supporting them spiritually on the inner is a much more powerful thing. You know, I'm so glad you brought that point up um, because, yeah. you know, we can, and I, I, I instruct my clients and my classes that, uh, about this. I call it the bubble, putting, putting somebody in the bubble. You create the bubble and you put that person in there and you send that person these loving thoughts, whatever it is that, that is right. required at the moment. And then once you can feel that you're done filling them with whatever it is that you're sharing with them, you just release the bubble. You release it, let it float away. That's and, right. And, you know, I have found some pretty miraculous things in my life. I wish it happens every time, but it doesn't because we cannot interfere with the free will of another, which is another right. thing that, that, that's a no-no for me is, you know, just because you can manipulate somebody to try to be better doesn't mean you should. That may not be their life path. So, right. again, right. that's the non-judgment thing, right? So, yeah. when you get to that point, then you just you, you – just, 
let it you just have to release all of that and you have to make sure that you're just sending it to that person if they're meant to get the message their higher selves will make sure the message is delivered that's right absolutely you have to trust the process whether you can see it or not you have to trust the process because it works yes in many cases not in every case because again it's not up to us to decide what their life path is there maybe they're not connected real well with their higher selves so they they disavow that internal communication that comes you know a lot of people do do that you know they push it away like oh that's just you know silly thoughts in my head whatever and that's okay right yeah it's it's okay there's no judgment there because we're we're different we've all had different experiences so in your books you know you explore this and we're talking about fifth dimensional plus beings that were you're writing about here and that's what I'm I try to express to the audience and maybe I wasn't real clear so I'd like to kind of state that clear is that these experiences that these more elevated or higher conscious beings are having are not so dissimilar from our own that we experience here on earth they're more in depth maybe they're more intense maybe but only because that level of sensing and feeling and knowing and understanding is also deeper so it is it is and in book three um it uh it is explored more where one of the crafts by the way um uh is in all of the dimensions at once and they can walk with a thought from one dimension to the other and be on the same craft but it's different looking on the inside with a different crew and they all interact because all of the dimensions are married to each other and what happens in one affects the other and that is very very dear to them to make sure that everything is harmonious so when there are wars and there are things that are blown up like on this planet, it is felt in all of the rippling dimensions and other uh, mirror universes, if you want to call them that, um, and into the other dimensions as well. Another thing I just wanted to bring up is um, being an impact uh, from doing this work is that all of these characters, I mean, all, all of the beings that are in the book, um, I I actually felt their feeling body and who they were and the and their thought process and the love that was in their heart and and even um all these fully conscious beings were were so beautiful that literally before I would even start writing I would just cry beautiful tears of joy and then when you start getting into the created beings and the gods and the angels and the archangels and that you literally just go into this blissful, teary nirvana. I can't even explain it. It's so amazing to even see into those realms and go there. And when I sit down and I meditate and I go high up, to go and visit those realms is so unbelievably rewarding that I, I want everybody to have that experience, and that's why I really wanted to try and convey it through, um, you know, Christine Dennett's beautiful artwork. She, her and I, are, our minds are just melded, and she's, uh, you know, I met her many, many years ago when I wanted to start illustrating the book, and I met her in Follow Your Heart Restaurant, which is a health oh. food restaurant. Oh, and thank you. And isn't that it. great? It and is. we were sitting there and she just said I she said I I just have to acclimate to your energy give me a minute and then she looked at me and then she looked way above my head and she said there is a very tall blonde man over seven feet tall with long blonde hair standing behind you and he's telling me his name is Theron I said his name is Tehran that's close enough I said you got the job if you want it so She's been very connected to Tehran from day one. So even when I when I explain to her and sit with her and we she sketches everything out. The sketches are gorgeous, by the way, because they're all in pencil. 
and um, and then she goes into the computer, and I give her all the colors and everything of, of how everybody is, and um, it's it's just you know from from book one to book three, everyone uh, who writes me tells me that they're so happy that they get to see the visuals because they actually connect into them, and a lot of them feel that that these beings were where they came from or that they felt so connected to them and that that energy signature helped them delve even deeper into the book where their soul got more from it. So Exactly. So for that, I'm really grateful. And in the back of each book is a terminology of the extraterrestrial world. So I always suggest to anybody who gets them now, in each book, the terminology, some things are a little the same, but there's a lot of new stuff in each book. So I always suggest read the terminology first. And then, um, and then go back and start reading the book. Therefore, you don't have to go back and forth and go, ooh, what, what's a Merkaba vehicle or what's a this or what's a that or, uh, you know, those kind of things. And a lot of times, even though something might be explained a little bit in the book, I, I will go into a greater explanation in the terminology so people can get the whole full round of it. And, you know, it was it is extremely helpful. One of the other things that I'd like to share with everyone tonight before we run out of time is that um, as you're, you're, you know, reading through the books and you are getting spiritually connected, you're also learning about, we talked about it in the beginning, about the good and the evil. That's what we call it, good yeah. and evil. Even, right. even those that we consider evil beings, in the book they're depicted, you know, they're drawn, she, she sketched them out. And yeah. they're they're not anywhere near the horrific images that are pressed upon us on this earth plane at this time and have been for quite a few centuries now. Right, um, right. And it makes you understand the world in which they really, really come from, you know. Um, you, you understand their humanity. Yeah. Uh, you understand and how they, they are. lost they it. Are people and how they lost it. They were people. They are people and... and how they started descending and and gradually became who they were. That's right. So it it makes it it puts it in a form that's no longer fearful um, of of what people of what people think and and that kind of thing and and it. You know, uh, I that's the one thing that was uh, when when the books were done. I was like, wow, that really. To me, that really sort of put it into a perspective because now it puts a face to those names that people always feared, and now they'll understand who they were as people and that they really are just people. I mean, even beings that are fully conscious, they're just people. Yeah. We're all people. We're all, some people are a little more advanced. Some people aren't. So, but everyone is the same same and nobody treats anybody any different so um except on this planet so <laughs> well yeah yeah i mean and i'm sure there's probably another planet or two out there you know oh i'm sure there are but yeah. you know this is the next one that's being targeted and by the way um uh the the main focal point is Tehran starting in book 1 we learn that he is a dualistic being who was born into a fully conscious society one in every 200,000 beings in this fully conscious society is born dualistic and they are born that way because it helps everyone else who is fully conscious to understand what duality is and it helps the dualistic being to understand what being fully consciousness is so it's this it's they're both teaching mechanisms um so Tehran then later in his adult life is is given uh he becomes a um professor at the college advanced level of teaching messengers and mighty messengers who were coming into worlds on incarnation missions to raise consciousness. So that is a big part of his job at the University of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek 
is in the Mira system, and it is a galaxy that goes with 490 planets from one end to the other, which you can kind of see in a succession, and each one is a university planet. So everyone that leaves this world goes through Melchizedek until they get assigned to their next world, or if they end up going and working at Melchizedek um, and, and becoming an incarnation a messenger, a mighty messenger, whatever. The difference between messengers messengers come in to help raise a consciousness mighty messengers come in with a giant mission and to quick really quicken it to help pull up the messengers as well so um, so it's it's a fascinating thing learning all about this University of Melchizedek and uh, and you know we we get to meet father Melchizedek who is the architect of uh, this incredible spiritual university who is third in command of the universe as well so um, which is really really special and there is an incredible rendering of father Melchizedek in book three so I think people will really hook into that so and you know um, the other thing I want to share with people too in the book that was really great was when you went into the secondary chakras and you work with the seven chakras and then you go in and talk about the other ones. Um, I don't yeah. want to, I don't want to spoil it. I'm not going to spoil it for anyone because they right. really they really need to work on that because you talk a lot about auras and chakras. I mean they're very yeah. they're very aware of that um, uh, when when they're going through the. Uh, the the individuals as you're as you're progressing through your storyline here, yeah. uh, I call yeah. it a storyline. It's just your it, it's sort of a story. I mean, it is your story, um, and I it's it, the benefits of this of it besides it just being a really cool trilogy. Again, right. it's just really yeah. cool. It will also be an education for you. It will also be. Uh, uplifting for you. It also make you cry in places, and some places you can yeah. see yourself in it. And you go, oh yeah, I could we used to work on that myself. You know, <laughs> you, you begin. You know, you really it it is. It's very eye opening, um, and it, it's absolutely fun to read. It's absolutely fun. It's a page turner. All of all of your all of your books are page turner. So before yeah. we yeah. before we run out of time here, why don't you? Any last thoughts? Anything else you'd like to share before you give everyone, you know, all the websites again? What, what would you like to share before we let you go here tonight? Well, I, I think what I'd the one thing is just uh, just really live your life in simple truth. Don't get into thinking about all different kinds of things, you know, it's just sit down, just meditate, work on yourself. If you're presented with a very uh, a conflict. Uh, something that's going in and on in your life, look in the mirror and say, what is that doing for me, right? What, people will love the imager that's in, the, that's in all of the Yes, books. yes. Uh, the imager does many, many things, but one of the things is, is you can catapult your consciousness and make yourself an image of yourself in front of yourself that will talk to you truthfully and tell you, what you're doing and why you're thinking in a certain way and where it was caused in your life so you can go back and try and fix it. And that is an amazing thing. So if you can learn to do that and really look at yourself objectively and say, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm being too harsh in this situation. So let me just sit back. Let me just meditate. Let me just put love on this situation. Let it heal. Give it some time that kind of thing. The one thing that I used to do all the time was I wanted everything rectified right away instead of leaving time to heal so that the other person could heal as well. Because uh. I used to only just think of myself healing and I just want to be done with this situation. Now I look at the whole of how all people can heal through whatever situation it is and, and um, no matter what time frame it is, because I wanted everything nightly, nicely wrapped up and put in a box, yeah. right? Yeah. So. <laughs> that's good, yeah, that's, that, I understand, right. my hand's raised. Yeah, we, we all understand that. <laughs> so, Unfortunate. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the websites for the books are autobiographyofunanet.com, 
and uh, they can buy all the books there. And uh, like I said, we have a super fan special if people want to get all three books. They can buy them individually. I'm, I autograph and personalize them as well. And stranger at the Pentagon dot com. Um, and both websites are all newly revamped. And uh, uh, you can learn more about the feature film uh, on StrangerAtThePentagon.com. Uh, also read about the short film and all the things that happened. And you can also, there's a resource page of all the shows and all the things that I've been on. You can, they can watch the short film, by the way, on the website. And they can get all of Dr. Frank's books as well there, uh, the posters of Victor One, um, all kinds of wonderful, one-of-a-kind Stranger at the Pentagon stuff. And uh, all his books are going for a fortune online now, and they're used. So I've got the last remaining ones uh, from the publisher. So, And I also have one other uh, caveat. I have original book posters when the book came out originally, and I've only got like 25 of those left. They're oh, a collector's wow. item that the publisher found and gave to me. So um, all of that's on the buy book and DVD uh, thing. So, you know, people can scroll through there. So lots of really, really cool stuff. And, um, you know, and if people haven't, uh, you want to learn more about the story, you know, you can watch the short film, of course, or go on YouTube and type in the mysterious nine ancient aliens and watch the incredible job that they did. I'm in one, uh, one segment, Laura Eisenhower, uh, President Eisenhower's great, great granddaughter corroborates the story. Paul Hellyer, as well as, you know, Giorgio and uh, Michael and everybody else. And George Nuri's on the episode, J.J. Hurtak. Um, it's an amazing, amazing uh, piece. So um, be sure and see it. It's just beautiful. They did a fantastic job. Well, Craig, honestly, I had like 7,000 more topics. Um, <laughs> well, I'll come back on. No, let's I was going to ask you. and I, you know, <laughs> let's just make a date. <laughs> well, we're going to do that. I'll tell you what, I'll get a hold of you in the next few days, or you can get a hold of me in the next few days. We'll get something set up for a little bit later on this year. Um, I want to tell you, I wish you well on this Thank latest you. book um, that you have Thank released. You. Looking forward to information on the fourth book that you'll be doing as well. Updates yes. on Stranger at the Pentagon. This is, as always, Craig, you're just, it's just always really wonderful to have you on. I'm so glad that, that uh, we were able to have this time together for you, for me, for the audience, and for those who will be listening later. I appreciate you so much, and I can't wait to get you back on. And we're just going to have tons and tons of conversation. And I appreciate the audience checking in tonight. Thank you all for being here. And I want to thank Brian, uh, my engineer and producer, uh, for his wonderful work that he does in order to bring this uh, to you all. So with that, I'm going to bid you a good night. And until we meet again, where will your life's journey lead you? Many blessings, everyone, and good night. Blessings, everyone. Thank you.